Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is how expensive nuclear weapons are. This is pivoting slightly from where we have been with the rest of this unit. So far, we've been interested in understanding why countries develop nuclear weapons. The flip side of that coin is why countries do not develop nuclear weapons. And the focus here today is on costs. Nuclear weapons, it turns out, are very expensive. I want to begin with a few questions for you. In 2020 US dollars, from the beginning of the Manhattan Project through 1996, how much has the United States spent on developing nuclear weapons, deploying nuclear weapons, and handling nuclear weapons waste? To give you a better idea about why I'm phrasing these questions in this particular way, I'm citing data from a book called Atomic Audit. The goal of that project was to try to tabulate all of the expenses of nuclear weapons up until 1996. So that's what we have data on, and that's why I'm stopping there. But I'm using constant 2020 dollars so that we're calculating every single year of expense in terms of today's money so that you have a better idea about what inflation is implying here. So now that you have those three questions there, I want you to spend a moment to think about each one of them. And if you'd like to, go ahead and put your answer down below. We'll see what you have for that. And later on in this lecture, I will give you some answers. Let's start tabulating all of those costs, beginning with the direct costs of actually building the weapons themselves. It turns out that nuclear weapons used to be extremely expensive to build. That's because the world didn't really know what it was doing way back when. And so the designs that we had for things like uranium enrichment were not particularly efficient. That added to the time and costs to build nuclear weapons. Fast forward to today, nuclear weapons are still expensive. They're just not as expensive as they once were. The uranium centrifuge designs that we have to enrich uranium are much better at doing that process than the types of technologies that were used during the Manhattan Project. But nevertheless, they're still expensive to run. They still require your best scientists and your best manufacturers, and all of that is not going to come cheap. So it's not like you can just write a small check and be able to acquire a nuclear weapon. You're going to have to work a lot, and you're going to have to pay a lot to do it. To put a little more context on where all of that money is going, let's jump back in time to the Manhattan Project. We've talked before about how Clinton Engineer Works in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, was responsible for uranium enrichment during World War II. I also mentioned that at the time that the uranium enrichment was actually happening, Clinton Engineer Works was consuming 1% of all of the United States' electricity production. How is that possible? Well, in the absence of those efficient uranium centrifuges, the United States decided to enrich uranium through three separate processes because it believed that going through those three processes at low enrich to higher enrich to even higher enriched uranium would be more efficient than just using a single process. The first step of the uranium enrichment process was at the S50 Thermal Diffusion Facility. And you'll see a running name with all of these buildings. They all have very boring names because it was World War II and they were concerned about security. In any case, what thermal fusion does is heat the gas. And it turns out that the heavier uranium-238 gas will tend to congregate in colder areas, while the lighter uranium-235 gas will congregate in warmer areas. And by taking advantage of that slight difference, you can get slightly higher concentrations of uranium-235. The uranium then went to the K-25 gaseous diffusion facility. This building is enormous. In fact, it was the largest building ever constructed at the time, and it's more than a mile long. The name itself, K-25, comes from the code word for uranium, and very fittingly, the building itself is shaped like a U. The way gaseous diffusion works is by pushing the uranium gas through membranes. And because uranium-238 is slightly larger than uranium-235, those 238 atoms are going to be going through at a lower rate than the uranium-235 will. And as a consequence, you get an increasing concentration of that uranium-235. The final destination was Y-12, 
a calutron facility. Calutrons create magnetic fields, and it turns out that the heavier uranium-238 is less affected by the magnetic field than uranium-235. And once again, that leads to an increasing concentration of uranium-235 to the point where now it could be used for a weapon. Compare all of that to today. Now we just use uranium centrifuges. And yes, cascades of centrifuges take up a good amount of space, and they require a lot of electricity to run. But this isn't a mile-long building, and it's not going to eat up 1% of all of the United States' electricity consumption. It's relatively cheaper to do now, although still somewhat expensive. I've also noted before that boosted fission devices and thermonuclear weapons use tritium, and that tritium has a relatively short half-life. So another cost of developing and maintaining those nuclear weapons is to replace that tritium on a somewhat regular basis. Surprisingly, those direct costs are all just a drop in the bucket compared to the indirect costs of nuclear weapons. Development itself is only one piece of the puzzle. You also need to maintain them, deliver them, and then dispose of them afterward. And these costs combined are more expensive than actually building a nuclear weapon. Think about why that's the case. During the Cold War, the United States had three different delivery systems, all of which needed to be created and operated. They had planes, bombers that would drop a nuclear weapon. They had intercontinental ballistic missiles that could be fired from the United States and hit a target all the way in the Soviet Union. And we had submarine-launched ballistic missiles, which would require submarines to be built and operated so that they could fire missiles from down below the surface. And if you think about the actual maintenance and operation of these things, especially with those planes that were flying nonstop during the Cold War, or at least the early part of it, all of those expenses are really going to rack up. And as a consequence, you're going to have to pay for them, and it's going to make nuclear weapons look less attractive. These types of concerns played an important role in convincing Japan not to go beyond exploring nuclear weapons. The landmass itself of Japan is very small. And so, if an enemy like the Soviet Union decided to destroy all of Japan at once, it might be able to do that very quickly. In turn, if Japan wanted to have a nuclear weapon and be able to threaten the Soviet Union with retaliation, keeping those missiles in Japan would not have been necessarily the best idea. That would point to having something like a submarine-launched ballistic missile instead, which could stay safely below the sea and survive a first strike from the Soviet Union. Japan's other big issue is that it's very far away from the high-value targets within the Soviet Union. So even if Japan developed a nuclear weapon, they would have had to have figured out a way to deliver it all the way to the other side of the Asian landmass. Again, very expensive. Now let's talk about cleanup. This is the Hanford nuclear site in the state of Washington. Here you can see it under construction, and this is one of its main reactors. The Hanford site is where the United States acquired plutonium for the Manhattan Project, and would later also use this for a lot of the weapons that the United States made during the Cold War. After you run nuclear fuel through a reactor and extract the plutonium, you still have nuclear waste left over. What Hanford did, as is common for nuclear waste around the world, is put it into a pool of water. This serves two purposes. First, surprisingly, water does a good job of blocking out the radiation. And second, even spent nuclear fuel is hot and remains hot for a long time. So if you put it into a pool of water, you cool that pool and you cycle the water out, you are going to eventually cool down the fuel cells. This is what one of those pools looks like, but zoomed out. The previous photo was actually from the Hanford site. This photo, somewhat ominously, comes from Fukushima. Regardless, if you're an American taxpayer, I sincerely hope you enjoyed this slideshow on the Hanford nuclear site. Why? Well, there are a series of leaks coming out of that site. And guess what? It's going to cost more than $100 billion to clean up. Let's go back to those questions from earlier. In 2020 US dollars, up through 1996, how much has the US spent on developing nuclear weapons, deploying nuclear weapons, and handling nuclear weapons waste? Here are your answers. $1,000. 
677 billion dollars on building the weapons, 5 trillion 368 billion dollars on deploying the weapons, and a relatively sparse 74 billion dollars on the waste. But keep in mind that all of that money I cited for the Hanford nuclear site is coming after 1996. That's sort of a hidden cost of developing nuclear weapons. When you're worried about the waste, that's a long-term cost. You don't really experience it in the present, but you are going to suffer the consequences in the future. Seeing all of these high values leads to another interesting question. Just what has the U.S. spent more on during that time period than nuclear weapons? As you're thinking about that, I want you to keep in mind that this study did more than just calculate the cost of building weapons, deploying weapons, and nuclear weapons waste. There are other categories of nuclear weapons expenses, ranging from defending against other nuclear weapons to things that are tangentially related to nuclear weapons like the U.S. space program, different expenditures within the space program that also could qualify as something that the U.S. was spending money on as a consequence of the nuclear weapons program. So think about that. What other things beyond nuclear weapons did the U.S. spend more on from 1940 to 1996? It turns out that the answer is only two things, conventional military defense and social security. Things like income security, welfare, interest on the U.S. national debt, Medicare, veterans benefits, they're all less than the amount of money that the U.S. spent on nuclear weapons when you have that expansive definition. And even if you're going with a more restrictive definition, you're still going to have only defense, social security, income security, and interest go above that. And while the goal of this lecture has in large part been to put a price tag on nuclear weapons, I want you to also think about the opportunity costs of building nuclear weapons. Building nuclear weapons requires some of your best and brightest scientists to be working on an essentially destructive task. What if instead they were working on something constructive, like nuclear power? Imagine how much energy a country could have if they diverted all of their nuclear scientists to that sort of activity instead. All told, the key takeaway here is that nuclear weapons are very expensive. And while you may hear a rogue policymaker say something along the lines of nuclear weapons will only cost our country a few billion dollars, that's taking a very narrow look at what the costs of nuclear weapons are, the true price of nuclear weapons. And when you start factoring in all of the other things that come along with it, like the delivery and maintenance of nuclear weapons, these things are actually very expensive. And that's going to keep a lot of countries from developing nuclear weapons. That wraps up this lecture. Hope you enjoyed it, and hope to see you next time. Take care.